Today, zinc 0.2% aluminum. In some places, may use zinc 5% aluminum. But what has been developed is zinc containing 6% aluminum and 3% magnesium. 3% magnesium. The way forward, as as we think, there will be always a trend. The market will be asking for better corrosion resistance. The cost is always going to be a big criterion for selection of uh, steel. So we have to get higher corrosion resistance at a lower cost. As a result, there will be a need for continuous improvements of primary coatings, secondary coatings, to achieve what the market requires. The demand will be for coatings, which are amenable for high-speed manufacturing. The customer requirements will always become more and more stringent over years. All coatings should address the environmental concerns well. Then there should be a defined process for recycling of material. Thank you. Thank you, Development, and the way the Tata Steel is going about uh, having the more durability, controlling the cost and the environment. I hope uh, the experience he has shared must be beneficial to all of you. The next speaker, uh, I would request uh, Mr. Stephen to take up the dais, uh, and he would speak on zinc market potential and new applications which are emerging worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, once again up to Stephen Wilkinson, who shall be deliberating on the aspect of Keynote on zinc market potential and new applications. Speak from here. Do we have a remote? To, ah, perfect. Well, good morning again. I'm going to uh, take the helicopter view and, and, and not get too detailed in technical discussions this morning because you're going to get a lot of that as we go through. So uh, I'm going to focus on the world of zinc and galvanizing some new perspectives. I've been... Uh, in the zinc business for over 30 years. So you could say zinc is in my blood, which is actually good, we'll find out in a minute. And, and if you take a look on the left, our, our logo, our, our slogan has been zinc essential for life, which of course it is for humans and, and crops as we'll see, but also for steel. That makes steel last a lot longer. And I think that's the message we've got to get across to people making investments in infrastructure is that this little bit of extra cost in the short term pays off in the long term. I'm going to talk about a little bit about IZA as, a, as an advertisement, talk about the market background, industry changes, some of the programs we're doing, and a, and a summary. Well, as our mission was said earlier, that uh, we really are here to help grow and protect the world markets for zinc. And we do that by communicating the benefits of zinc, particularly the specific attributes that make zinc sustainable and essential for life. And that goes across all the different end uses that we do. We are uh, about uh, 23 years old, uh, based in Brussels, Belgium, but uh, an office in Durham, North Carolina, and as well offices in, in Europe, um, Europe and, and Peru, uh, China, India, and these dots represent some of our member companies. So we have uh, three categories of members. We have 43 full members who are mining or refining, smelting, uh, recycling companies, we have affiliate members such as steel mills, general galvanizers, uh, and 50 associ eight associate members such as the European Galvanizers Association, the American Galvanizers Association, and so on. We represent about 80% of the world production, uh, world production, 60% of world, so uh, you can see that we, we, we could get more members in China um, for sure. Three legs to our stool. As, a, as an organization, all under the umbrella of sustainable development, uh, technology and market development, uh, environment and health, and communications. And they all kind of come together, as you'll see as we uh, go through this. Uh, we're, I don't want to spend a lot of time on environmental issues, but I think the bottom line for zinc, it's, it's got a very good story to tell in terms of environment. And we've just published a, a uh, a publication called Zinc and the Environment, Understanding the Science. It's available on the website. But, you know, if, if you go to Scandinavia, they believe all metals should be banned because they're bad. They're heavy, so let's get rid of them. Let's find substitutes and get rid of them. And it's, it's a big fight, 
Where's Christian Decker? I mean, we, we, and, and Philip, we see this in Europe in particular. Uh, and so the International Zinc Association is working on a whole host of different regulatory issues globally. And it includes the International Maritime Organization, new rules for shipping concentrates, REACH program. If you make product in Europe or sell product in Europe, you have to go through an elaborate uh, process to register your products. And IZA has been coordinating that on behalf of the industry. And here's the bad news, is that when one jurisdiction decides that they've got a, a good thing happening for environmental issues and create huge new bureaucracies, other countries say, hey, we should do the same. And so we're seeing other countries adopt some of the REACH process in Australia, Canada, Japan, Korea, and so on. We've been working on water framework directive. How do you measure the right levels of zinc in the water and what, what tools do you use to, to do that? Uh, emission trading schemes, nano zinc, a host of other things that we work on in a day-to-day -day basis. Well, the big key buzzword these days is sustainability and indeed life a couple of years ago. And because designers and specifiers of, on the automotive sector and in the construction sector are saying, if it's not green, we're not going to specify it. Or the flip side of that, if it's not green, we're getting rid of it. And so you now have to go through an elaborate process scientifically to show what is your environmental footprint for your particular product. And so we've done that for zinc, uh, as I'll show in a minute. But it's, by the way, it's very disturbing to see a brand new BMW in Germany being built, 500 series, and they bust it down as soon as it comes off the line and count the parts and see what parts are good and what parts are bad. But that's uh, what they're doing. So what have we done as eyes at A? We've conducted an LCI analysis, life cycle inventory. And uh, in fact, we're just updating that as we speak. All the member companies and, and f representing 50% of the tonnage of the zinc, global zinc industry, we're getting a real good environmental footprint. And that can be used by the next downstream users, such as General Galvanizers, to compare your products with paint, with plastics, with aluminum, and so on, on a scientific basis to do that. So we're, uh, we're doing that. Recycling is a key part of that whole process. And uh, 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 when we, whoop. here's what the aluminum business says. You know, the reason zinc prices are going up is because the world is running out of zinc. So you, shouldn't, you should use aluminum instead of zinc. Well, this is not true. I'm not going to go into all the details of this picture, but at the end of the day, there's plenty of zinc uh, in the ground that can supply us for hundreds of years, but it's not running out of, the world is not running out of zinc, and we've got the proof to show that. So if you hear that, it's probably coming from our competitor metal, and it's probably coming uh, f for market share reasons, but we've got the statistics to tell you why not. Uh, Recycling is a key issue of sustainability, and over 60% of zinc is used for galvanizing steel now, and over 83% of that galvanizing steel is recycled. And I think that's an important aspect that, that uh, we can tell uh, groups, particularly as the resource efficiency message becomes more and more important from that perspective. In Europe, you see zinc sheets on roofing materials. Uh, they're the biggest market for that. But 90% of all zinc sheet is recycled. Now, the issue is it lasts about 80 to 100 years. So it doesn't come back to be recycled until after the end of the use of that, uh, of that product. And over 4 million tons of zinc are recycled each year. 60% of zinc is recycled. So we've got very good stories to tell uh, about the whole environmental and sustainability aspect of, of zinc. Recycling rates, there's a whole bunch of definitions. I could spend a, a day talking about them, but you have to... People get very detailed, and that's why we're working with the Copper Association Nickel to make sure we've got common definitions of recycled content. Uh, and then you'll see on the world basis, the end of life recycling rate is 50% for zinc, and it's 25% in India, or 35% in India, the latest numbers we've got, which I think can tell you that we've got a way to go to recycle more zinc in this country. And life cycle assessment, this is what I'm saying in terms of understanding from Cradle to grave. So when you make, take the zinc out of the ground till it gets recycled, what are the whole processes of that? I just mentioned we're updating the zinc inventory analysis, which will be done by uh, this month, actually. And this is the result. This is a type of analysis you can do as a galvanizer, is you take a look at the 
sustainability of hot dip galvanizing versus painted steel across a number of different uh, specters uh, on the environmental front. So, uh, um, you know, the greenhouse effect, the acidic effects, and so on. And this can be presented to uh, key authorities and decision makers like the Leeds people uh, in the UK. We've got some great themes to be able to talk about zinc. You see some of them along the top here. Zinc is essential, zinc is sustainable, uh, zinc is durable. So there's a lot of very positive messages we've got about the zinc metal itself to be able to, to uh, communicate. Well, I, I'm going to talk about health for a minute. You're going to say, what the heck has zinc got to do with health? But uh, uh, it does. It's essential for health. It was a couple of years ago when Bjorn Lomberg, who heads up the Copenhagen Consensus in Denmark, came out, and they're a think tank. They've got five Nobel laureates sitting on their, their think tank group of seven or eight. And they came out and said, the number one world issue is children's malnutrition. That if you invested $1 in society, you'd get a $17 return on this issue. And this is back when the oil prices and the economic crisis was still in everyone's mind. Uh, we actually had Jorn Lomberg speak at one of our zinc conferences uh, a year or two ago. And uh, he, he's one of the smartest guys you're going to meet in the world. And basically, the fact that my chairman at the time said, well, how did you get them to convince to, to, to say this for zinc? That we, I said, well, we didn't. Uh, now, Bjorn Lomberg says we should have. But, uh, but here are the statistics, and they're pretty awful. Pretty awful statistics. Two billion people worldwide don't get enough zinc in their diets every day. Two billion. 1.5 million people, or children, uh, die each year from diarrhea. And zinc helps the immune system and helps prevent diarrhea or helps with diarrhea if you've got it. 800,000 people are at risk of zinc deficiency and at risk of dying each year, and 450,000 children. So it's, you know, it's, it's awful. Now, you have to measure the zinc levels in your, in your blood, uh, but the, the proxy for zinc deficiency is stunted growth. So here, here's uh, two girls, uh, and you can see the difference at both about the same age of two, and the weight differential of, of over a kilogram, the height difference of 12 centimeters, you know, it's, it's the proxy. And here are the countries with the highest malnutrition rate or zinc deficiency rate. And yep, India's on it. India's one of the worst countries in the world for malnutrition. And it's, it's sad. Uh, so what did we do? We said, let's go to UNICEF and talk to UNICEF and say, we'll work with you in some of these countries to help this malnutrition problem. UNICEF said, we don't want your dirty money. What? We're talking about giving you a million dollars a year for four years. And they said, well, no, we, we don't take money from the oil industry. We don't take money from Nestle because they're dirty companies and dirty industries, and we think you are too. It took one year to negotiate. We said, look, you're using zinc on your kids to prevent diarrhea. So how could you say we're a dirty industry? And so we convinced them. And we coined the Zinc Saves Kids program, which we've now had for over four years, uh, going on five. And now UNICEF thinks we're pretty good people. So it, it, it takes that relationship to get to you know one another before you, you get into that mode. We've also been working with here in India, with the Clinton Global Health Access, CHAI, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And by the way, this year, Bill and Melinda Gates are spending $9 million on zinc programs here in India, just alone. And, you know, basically, everything from training practitioners to delivering the medicines, or the medicines, the zinc tablets, together with other micronutrients. It's, it's a fantastic program. And, and what Lomberg said is that you don't need more research like AIDS. It's there. You just need to deliver this and get the people getting zinc in their, in their diets. The, the best thing that's come out of this, though, is that some of our member companies have upped the ante. They said, great, Isaac A, you've done a good job, but we're going to have our own programs. And that, so we've got companies like Tech, MMG, Lundin Foundation, and I put Hindustan Zinc on this list because they're the final pros of a, a major discussion with UNICEF. And I hope I'm not speaking out of school, Hindustan Zinc, but it's going to be fantastic if it happens, and it will, to help this whole program of malnutrition here in India. And so 
we're talking now millions of dollars on the table rather than the one million that Isaac A had. And it's a great message that, that zinc is used to help solve one of the global programs that we've got. From our point of view as an industry, it's generated a whole host of, of good public relations for us as well. So groups like the Wall Street Journal have written up on this. And in fact, we had a company called Meltwater, a public relations firm, and we had them do a survey of, of impressions, positive impressions on the zinc. And take a look since we started the health program, it's just ramped up tremendously in terms of the positive impact we get in the press because of zinc and mainly because of the health impact of that. Now you're going to ask, well, why are these kids, why aren't they getting the zinc? By the way, we need, as adults, 12 to 15 mg's of zinc in our body every day. Most of us get it in our daily foods and you need to replenish that almost on a daily basis. And, but the, one of the reasons is it's not in many of the world crops. And so we've also started a program called Zinc, uh, the Zinc Nutrient Initiative, where zinc is essential for crops. So zinc has the same impact on, on, on uh, wheat and maize as it does on humans. It helps the immune system. It actually helps the crop grow faster. But more importantly, the status of zinc goes three times higher into the crop. So that is actually going to get into the children's diet because 50% of the world's, including in India, soils are zinc deficient. So here's the correlation of the zinc deficient soils and the zinc deficient humans. Don't need to tell you there's about a 99% correlation factor there. So if you're living here in India, guess what? Where's Sumitra? Where does Sumitra disappear? We went 55% of our crops here in India are deficient of zinc. And we need to add them. So we've then here, wow, and it's projected even worse to increase to 63% by the year 2025. And there's the map of, of some of the parts of India where they're, they're deficient. So, so here's what we've got, and we've got another issue. We have to improve the productivity of crops by 70% in order to feed the world's population by the year 2050. So our population is growing faster than crop yields because a lot of these farms are getting eaten up by urbanization. So, Here's what we've done. We've done experiments here in India where we've taken crops of parts of land and put no zinc on it. The other part we put zinc on it and you get some grain yields of up to a 30% increase. Now think about this. Uh, you pay 20 to 50 ex rupees extra for your fertilizer product and you get a 30% return as a farmer on your, your crops. It's a no-brainer from an investment point of view and Plus, you get the status of the zinc in the, uh, in the crop. So we put together the Zinc Nutrient Initiative with a number of objectives, increasing the zinc fertilizer market, improving the crop yield, improving farmers' incomes, improving the nutritional value of the crops, and improving food security. And we've had some great developments. Uh, Sumitra Das, Dr. Das, has been the uh, manager of that program here in India, uh, working together with the Fertilizer Association of India. We've had huge success. Uh, the zinc subsidy, subsidy was included in, the, in 2010. 31 new fertilizer grades have added zinc over the last three years. And we've seen a 50% increase in zinc fertilizer use in the last two years. Um, and there's the, the market size we're talking about. And there is a government initiative being looked at right now with urea and zinc. And if that happens, you're gonna see another spike in the market for, for zinc consumption in here in India. Uh, and of course, the next steps, and Sumitra, you've been working with uh, these people to look at this mandatory zinc urea fortification, including customized fertilizers and the NBSS. And again, this can be zinc oxide or zinc sulfate uh, from the use point of view. Uh, by the way, as an example, I'll just step back for a minute in terms of the process. Uh, it was four years ago when we started this program, and the chair at the time said, what's your best program you've got at Isaac A? And I said, well, zinc and fertilizers. Well, what's going to happen with it? Well, we're going to educate a couple of farmers and a couple of fertilizer companies. Well, will you make any impact or dent? Well, you know, 
Don at $40,000 a year, that nothing's going to happen. You'd have to spend $400,000 a year. Well, why aren't we spending $400,000 a year? Well, Don, we don't have the money. <laughs> That's easy. Well, if the case is that good, get, write the business plan, get on the phone, we'll get the money up from the member companies, and we'll fund this to make it happen if it's that good. And I must admit, even with this gray hair, I learned a heck of a lot. If you focus and get the right resources, things will happen. And if we continue to spend $40,000 a year on it, nothing would have happened. And we've made, made, made a real dent. OK, let's look at the uh, geographical side of zinc. Um, and we can see that uh, what we've said in, lately is if you want to know what's going on in the zinc market, you better know what's going on in China. You know, it was only several years ago China accounted for 15% of the, of the use of zinc in the world. Now they're at 44%. India has also doubled from 2.7% to 5.1%. To but I think that there's huge opportunities, as we'll see in a minute. If you take a look at the zinc consumption per capita, this will tell you. So if you look at Europe, and where's, uh, where are, we've got a couple of Europeans here. If you, and as a Canadian, having lived in, in Brussels, if you walk around Brussels, you can't find anything that needs to be galvanized. It's all galvanized. It's, whether it's bike stands, it's street furniture, light poles, the, the, the wire holding up trees on the street, it's all galvanized. Whereas you go to some of these other countries, United States included, there you see, ah, there's an opportunity here. It's paint or it's bare steel. And so if you look at the per capita consumption, it's almost six kilos per capita for zinc consumption in Europe as compared to three in the US and three in, in, in Asia Pacific and India, 0.3. I think we're up to 0.5 now, our latest statistics, uh, 0.5. Uh, China at 1.3, the global average 1.9. So what does that tell you? It tells you that here in India, we have huge opportunity to take this 0.3 up at least 10 times to 3.3. That's what it tells you, just getting to half the European standard. So it means that there's huge opportunity for growth here in India. The major end uses, we just talked about, you know, galvanizing now accounts for up close to 60% of the world market. And, and that's increased tremendously. A third of that is hot dip, two thirds of that 60% is, or 56% is, is continuous. Um, and so really we're not, we're not like lead where we're just batteries, but we are indeed becoming, uh, having a big horse that is driving the market, and if you take a look at the galvanizing sales growth over the last five years, it's much faster than the other uses in the uh, segments. But Andrew probably knows more about this than, than me. In the in terms of the Indian galvanizing market, again, you take a look at the sheet tube, general and wire, and so on. Uh, some different dynamics here in India, and we're going to get into that, I think, as this program goes on. Well, here's our uh, technology market development program, Frank runs this program, so you're going to be hearing from Frank a couple of times over the course of the next day or two. Uh, we've got Martin Gagné, who was uh, formerly with uh, Extrata. Uh, uh, Dr. Das, who is with uh, doing the fertilizer program here in India. Rayul Sharma, who's doing the Indian program. And Ken D'Souza, who's a consultant with us, uh, working on, on uh, construction and automotive side of. So we've got a very strong, solid team here dedicated to helping grow the markets here in India. And steel's unique advantage is it stops corrosion. And here's the corrosion you get. Not only is it ugly, but it's unsafe. And here's a picture of a steel that was under a uh, concrete of a parking garage in Elliott Lake, Ontario, Canada. Just not less than a year ago, it collapsed. Killed two people. So not only is rust or corrosion a cancer, but it can kill. And of course, in this case, they're adding a lot of salt to the parking garage uh, as the cars went up and dropped the salt because it's in a cold uh, climate in the winter. But killing people because of corrosion, we, this is unbelievable. This is acceptable these days. And in India, the coastline is gigantic here where you get all the salt and corrosion. So. Here's what it costs governments. 
the ranges from between 4 and 6% of GDP uh, is spent on fixing corrosion problems. Personally, I find that unacceptable as a taxpayer, that by spending a little extra money now, I'm not going to have to spend that, that uh, 3 or 4% of GDP, grow, uh, GDP to fix these corrosion problems. So pay me now or pay me later. And you know, look at the money being spent. In fact, we're not, we haven't even talked about the budget here uh, yet, but uh, this $1 trillion is, is a lot of money to spend. We should be protecting it. You would with your own investments, you make sure you had insurance or protection. The protection is galvanizing. And zinc is durable, so that's its major strength from that point of view. Here in India, we've had recently a trading program for galvanizers. We put together uh, an interactive training tool, ITT, for galvanizers. We had Mike Ainsley, I didn't show him on the list, come and put that program on. It was developed for China, actually, a, a common fund for commodity program. So co we actually got a grant for close to a million dollars from the UN to, to do that. And then we've applied it into uh, India. It's a training program for not only managers of the plants, but the operators as well. And Raul can, can provide you information on that. Uh, if you want, we've been working with uh, looking at the whole electrification of station refurbishment and of course galvanized rebar we'll talk about in a minute. We just heard from Tata about automotive steels. Here's the thought I want to leave you with. Why in Europe and North America can we have seven to ten year rust warranties on our cars when we buy them? And in India, you have car companies here, all car companies here produce cars with galvanized steel. Except, most of those companies export the cars that have galvanized steel. The cars you buy as an Indian consumer don't have any zinc on them. And they're going to rust and corrode. I ask you, why do you accept that as an Indian consumer? You shouldn't. You should be saying, for the extra $80 it's going to cost to have that, and many of you go and get that underbody work done afterwards for $25 or $40, uh, which probably doesn't work. So why as an Indian consumer would you accept not having your car galvanized? It, 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 we just heard that the steel companies can make great galvanized steel sheets, the car companies can make it, and so should we. Frank's going to talk to you about the GAP program later on where we're working with the major automotive companies around the world to develop new or high strength steels and to make sure they're galvanized. And by the way, as those high strength steels come on and they're thinner, you better have them galvanized or they're going to rust more easily. We've got a Galvinfo center that answers any questions on, on, uh, on our website on white rust. In fact, we've engaged a consultant, the next Stelco guy from Canada. We've got uh, uh, fact sheets on, on certain aspects, and these have been translated into a number of different languages, but uh, if you go to galvinfo.com or our eyes at a website, you can get a hold of those. The ITT program I talked about uh, in terms of general galvanizing. Uh, rebar, this is another rusty picture of rebar. And Frank's going to spend a whole session on this, so I won't go into detail, but very little, very little uh, rebar is coated with steel. It's often used with epoxy in parts of the world. Uh, India, one of the countries in the world that did start this process quicker than others, the uh, uh, Lotus Temple, Pug is one of the first structures, I believe, to use galvanized rebar. Uh, but we've developed a new process of continuously galvanizing that rebar, which is less expensive, has a better coating, 50 microns of zinc, and it's a lower cost. And with epoxy being banned in some of these jurisdictions now, uh, two states have banned it, two provinces in Ontario, or Canada have banned it, it's time that this product be introduced into the marketplace. And we've been putting up a shows, getting standards put in place in certain countries, and I think that this is an opportunity for somebody in India to build one or two of these lines or three lines and make some money at it because it's going to, uh, it's going to go. Uh, Frank will also talk about thermal spraying and windmills being a big uh, opportunity. And of course, we've got uh, the railway issue uh, we'll hear about uh, later today. We've just developed a brochure of galvanizing and mining. I'm going to slap our wrist because as Miners and smelters, we have sometimes haven't specified our own product. And so this is an opportunity for us to use uh, and show the highlights and case studies of where you can use galvanized steel in a mine 
because repainting that or maintaining it afterwards is a very costly expense. A little bit on communications. We've got a zinc.org website. Uh, we get something like a million visitors a year to it. Uh, we've also developed a website in India. I uh, urge you to go to it. And it's uh, uh, zinc.org.in. And again, in three clicks, you should be able to find anything you want to know about, uh, about zinc. We've got galvanizing highlighted extensively on these websites. And let me just summarize. So, zinc. I think it's a strong industry globally with solid growth potential and particularly here in India. It's even got stronger growth potential. People talk about China, but I really think that India has got even more potential than China in many ways. Uh, we need to work on the standards, policies, and education, which are key. So it's important for us as an industry to educate those that are making those investment and infrastructure decisions that they need to protect their products, their steel products with steel. And in galvanizing, again, as a consumer, we need to be asking the car companies, why can't we buy a galvanized car here in India? And in fertilizers, I think we've seen a, a, a boon to, to that, uh, and, and which will help the malnutrition problem. Again, just huge potential. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for uprising us and making us explore about the immense untapped potential for zinc in India. Once again, thank you very much, and a big round of applause for that splendid presentation. Thank you. And yes, moving ahead, we would now like to take the discussion on demanding times for zinc, focusing on the international perspective on demand for zinc. And yes, for the same, we have amongst us Mr. Andrews Thomas, Senior Analyst, Zinc Market. Uh, Mr. Andrews uh, joined Woods McKenzie in 2005 as a refined zinc market analyst. He is responsible for developing the global refined zinc supply and demand forecast on 